Okay, so maybe this is a good time to begin. Our second lecture of today and of the school is by Antoine Braves, who comes to us from uh, outside of Paris um, in the laboratory of, uh, well, he leads a group in uh, quantum optics of atoms uh, in laboratory of Charles Fabry uh, as part of the Institute of Optique. And he will tell us about uh, Rydberg atoms and optical tweezers and doing many body physics and quantum information processing with those systems. So welcome Antoine and uh, take, a, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. So everyone can hear me well, that's fine. Yes. All right. Uh, so thanks a lot for the invitation. I mean, it's really, uh, of course, it would have been much better live, but, uh, you know, live uh, all in Boulder, we do what we can. So it's already very nice to have kept this event because, I mean, people are suffering from the lack of schools and uh, learning means those days. So, um, so what I will try to cover of all those three lectures are uh, something around uh, Rydberg atoms in optical tweezers. So it will many often more than really describing in details uh, particular experiments. I will try to use uh, Rydberg atoms in optical tweezers as an opportunity to tell you and to teach you, if I can, a few important concepts that you encounter uh, everywhere in AMO physics. Uh, you know, it can be a reminder of perturbation theory, a scene from the eyes of an experimentalist, it can be adiabatic passage, it can be Raman transition, all these words uh, that are routinely uh, used. And uh, essentially, uh, indeed, the general context is uh, many body physics and quantum information processing. Uh, so that's what I will try to, uh, to cover. So, uh, oops. Uh, thing. Ah, okay, so first problem, I just cannot move from one. Uh, it worked like a minute ago. Sorry about that. So the thing is stuck, so it starts not well. <clears throat> I had exact same problem. So don't yeah, worry. Uh, we're all used to it. It's the world of Zoom. And the thing is indeed um, okay. So sometimes if you use your computer, um keyboard is easier to pass. I don't know. Um Okay, that's very bizarre because it just worked a second ago. It is really stuck. So in a mode, which is a bit bizarre. Okay, so let me try again. Okay, so it seems to be working again. So sorry about that. Hopefully it's not going to happen too often. Right, so you can see the screen again. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, we'll see how it works. <laughs> so indeed, um, the, the general setup, the general framework of what we're going to discuss is quantum state in general. So seen through the eyes of many body physics and quantum information uh, processing. So the general ideas is that you want as an experimentalist, but also as a theorist, to create uh, controlled quantum systems, okay? And quantum, uh, quantum controlled states and to do many things. And so the kind of things that you can do, and we're going to spend a lot of time discussing that is of course, to study many body physics. So these uh, things will be quantum simulations, obviously. And I will talk a lot about it in uh, the third lecture. So in a nutshell, you want to understand the properties of a many body system by engineering one ideal many body system that more or less fulfills the same uh, rules and uh, is, is governed by the same Hamiltonian as the system you want to, to simulate. So that's one uh, particular example. There is another very important example of what these artificial or synthetic quantum system can do is they can prepare states that are useful for metrology. So you may uh, know that actually, if you start, you, you want to define time, essentially the way it's done is by taking a collection of atoms and all those atoms all behaves independently. Each of these atoms can be seen as a two level system. So ground and excited state. And essentially you will consider an isolated system as your reference 
uh, your frequency reference. So it's done using cesium those days, but there may be a change in the coming years due to the huge uh, improvement in optical clocks. But so if you want to look at what is the ultimate limit of a clock, you need to consider what is called the quantum projection noise. And so essentially, if you take an ensemble of independent emitters, so a collection of atoms that can be called atoms or atoms trapped in optical lattices, for example, then the delta nu over nu, which is the relative uh, frequency that, uh, that you can reach, scales like the inverse of the square root of the number of atoms. Uh, but it turns out that now, if the collection of atoms you're using is in an untangled or at least a correlated in the quantum sense uh, state, then you can go from this one over root n scaling to this one over n scaling, which is called the Heisenberg limit. And you see that you can gain a lot in the ultimate precision of the clock. And so, of course, I mean, once again, those machines, those synthetic matter, are able, using many body physics, actually, to prepare those states. And actually, Gila is one place where these things is the most developed, most likely. Of course, there is all this idea of quantum information processing, which actually usually can be this, uh, I mean, class, classified in two different uh, branches. The first one is how you transmit information in a secure way. So that's the, uh, what is called uh, quantum cryptography. And the second one is, of course, quantum uh, computing, uh, which for the moment only exists at an elementary uh, stage, but which is uh, something being developed in many years, in many labs. And so essentially, the advantage here is that contrarily to what people thought for a long time, the complexity of a problem can be changed by going from a classical algorithm to a quantum algorithm. And so the, the, the prospect and, and the, the hope that we have in by trying to design those quantum computers is to decrease an exponentially hard calculation into something which now becomes polynomially hard only. Okay. You may have prefactors, but that's the general idea. So that by changing from classical to quantum, you can go from uh, reduce the complexity of a problem to something untractable to something which now becomes tractable. And finally, there is another uh, example uh, of uh, things which is of general interest to many uh, physicists is that, of course, when you, you know that quantum physics is the theory that governs the microscopic world, there is no doubt about that, it has been tested. Uh, we also all know from our daily life experience that it doesn't work too well to apply quantum mechanics to uh, the objects surrounding us, uh, but rather we use Newtonian law, uh, sometimes relativistic laws and all this. And so, do we have something like a boundary between classical and quantum? And one way to attack the problem is just to look at how large we can build a quantum system. So we start with elementary uh, systems consisting of one, two, a few atoms, and we try to grow and see whether at some point the underlying law, the fundamental laws of quantum physics are, of, uh, are still valid. So for example, there is an open question, which is what is the validity? Uh, is there a range of validity of the superposition principle? I mean, this is the Schrodinger cat paradox. I mean, does it, can you get a Schrodinger cat in the real sense of, you know, a macroscopic object or not? So there is nothing in quantum physics that says that it should not be possible, but at the end of the day, we need to prove that by scaling up the size of the system. And so this idea of engineering quantum system is a bit tackling this kind of, uh, of subject. Okay. So that's just the general framework. And of course, I will say a bit more as we, uh, we dive into that. But of course, uh, what experimentalists have to do and have done with a lot of success actually over the last, let's say, maybe 30 years is by looking at the progress in manipulating individual quantum system, be they from the AMO atomic uh, molecular and optical world or be they from the condensed matter world, we are now able to implement and to really realize those synthetic matter. So in these slides, what you have are examples of system that allows individual particle control. I will say a bit more, of course, but essentially you've got cold atoms and molecules. We've just heard about that in the lectures of Eric Cornell. You've got the possibility to arrange ions in, uh, in traps separated by a few micrometers and to engineer and to, uh, to address each of them in order to create any uh, state you wish. And also, you can take photons, but if you want photons to behave uh, in many body uh, physics sense, you need them to interact in a way or in another. And you've got different ways to do that, either by sending them in uh, nonlinear media, 
there you will have the interactions between two photons. I mean, in free space, two photons do not interact. But if you place them in a medium, which is, let's say, a chi-2 medium, then they can, or chi-3 here, uh, you can, they can start to interact. So there is this idea of engineering non-linearities that can act at a single photon level. And people have demonstrated that at an elementary basis. So those are just the traditional individual uh, atomic systems that we kind of have in mind, but those are not the only ones. People have developed over the years lots of examples of individual atoms that come from the condensed matter uh, physics world. And so examples of these are just centers which are to say vacancies that you uh, create in a diamond, for example. You replace one carbon atom in this diamond structure by a nitrogen, and the other one you, uh, you replace by a vacancy. And you end up with having something which has a spectrum very close to the hydrogen spectrum. So it's really an, an artificial atom. The atoms are much more separated than they would be in, uh, than an electron is separated from, from, uh, from its nucleus. But still, it behaves exactly as an hydrogen atom under some approximation, obviously. Then you've got quantum dots. So quantum dots is just a region of space where you can trap electrons by using uh, semiconductors with different uh, gap, uh, band gaps, for example. So you can trap your electrons, and your electrons can be trapped in different uh, energy levels. So it acts a bit like a two-level system, once again. You've got superconducting circuits, which is very popular. For example, this is what IBM uses uh, as its qubit. And essentially, those consist in, uh, to make it very crude, of um, a Josephson junction. And essentially, you can encode two spins by having a current going in one direction. You will call it spin up. And the current going in the other direction, you will call it spin down. So that's another way to encode. A tool, uh, some information in this artificial system, which consists of many atoms, but still they act like an individual quantum system. You've got other kinds of systems, which I'm not doing to, to describe, but essentially we got kind of a mixture of those two things. So you create a pair of electron hole in a matrix, so it acts like an hydrogen atoms, and you place it in an optical cavity. So you surround it by a mirror. And so essentially, the coupling between this object and the cavity forms what is called a polariton. And this polariton is like a two-level system, which uh, is in the dissipative environment. So you can also use that uh, in order to implement many body systems. But they are in a dissipative and in a driven way. So those, just are, those are just, you know, I'm not asking you to understand all the details of what I'm saying now is just to give you an overview of various classes of quantum systems that people are considering. And that we will uh, discuss a bit during those lectures, essentially the first one. So once again, the very important point is that no matter the platform we are considering, essentially they all behave under some approximation under an ensemble of individual spin one half particles. And so, more importantly, you can also address them and control their interactions. So that's key, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So, coming back a bit more to the uh, quantum, um, to, to the AMO uh, platform, so atoms, molecules, and ions, what you have here uh, is another view of atomic arrays. So, atomic arrays uh, means atomic particles, be they ions or atoms or molecules, that you can essentially control one by one. And what I plotted here is the number of spins, which is to say of particles, that people are manipulating uh, almost routinely. And here, this is the kind of coupling that you can get between them. So coupling means really, I have two spins, and they will interact in some way that will make more precise as we go on. And I will call j the coupling constant between those two spins. OK, and so here, probably one of the most uh, and the best control system are trapped ions. So there, they managed to uh, have uh, systems of about 50 ions those days uh, that they can uh, control using laser beam. They can engineer the interactions using lasers. Uh, the, OK, and the typical size is about 50 <coughs> today. Uh, and the range of interactions can be actually set almost infinite. So you can uh, have an all-to-all -all connectivity in the systems. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you have atoms in ultra-cold lattices, which you will hear about a lot in the starting from like next week, I believe. And you have many lectures, including from Emmanuel Bloch, and he will discuss a lot about that. But essentially, you place your atoms one by one in the nodes 
of what is called an optical lattice, which uh, they will describe in more detail, but I will uh, give you some introduction about that tomorrow. Um, okay, and there usually the interactions between the atoms are uh, nearest neighbor interactions. So essentially, they interact only when they are in, uh, in, in sites that are close to each other. They can also inter interact if you place two of them on the same side. Then you've got some kind of intermediate system about the same size, a few thousand atoms or, that are manipulated. You've got polar molecules. So example of that are KRB, for example, which possess a permanent dipole moment, and you can make them interact in ways that needs to be a bit specified, but okay. You can have also magnetic atoms. So for example, if you take dysprosium atoms or chromium atoms, they have a large, I mean, some ground state properties that make them uh, strong um, small magnets. So essentially, their permanent magnet is as large as 10 times the Bohr magneton, which is much more than if you take atoms from the first column of the periodic table, for example. And so the platform that I'm going to discuss is something that was introduced a bit later in the literature, uh, which was, uh, which is arrays of Rydberg atoms. So Rydberg atoms, I will go into more details tomorrow, but essentially this is a gigantic atom. So a nucleus and the electron that spirals very far from it. So a highly excited state. And the thing uh, that this allows you to do is to make two atoms separated by a large distance interact with a, a large uh, interaction strength. And so, I mean, the idea is to arrange them in those kind of arrays. So this is a picture of real atoms arranged in this Kagome structure. And we will discuss that in detail tomorrow. So the asset of all those platforms is that first they are scalable. So in a sense that we have the hope to be able to scale them to numbers of atoms that are beyond a few hundreds. I mean, people are talking about uh, 10,000 or something like that. It depends on the details of the platform, but there is the potential for scaling up. Second, and that's very important when it comes to uh, many body physics and simulations uh, of many body systems, you can apply local manipulations on each of them. So essentially, you can apply a laser beam here and decide that you're going to talk only to this particular atom. And in this way, you can do single site or single atom type of measurement. You can, for example, measure the, uh, the, the spin components of each of the atoms in this. And because you can do that atom by atom on a single shot of the experiment, you can reconstruct something which is very hard to reconstruct in many body physics, which are correlation functions. Okay, and you can do that by, uh, you can even if you wish, uh, I mean, construct a third order correlation function or higher order correlation function. Once again, something very hard to do in quantum matter physics. And finally, they uh, have a certain amount of programmability. So what I mean by that, it's never the full programmability. So it means that you cannot engineer any Hamiltonian you would have in mind, but at least you can control the geometry. You can control to a certain extent the connectivity, which is to say one atom will interact with how many neighbors. And you can also, very importantly, uh, control the, the interactions between the particles, almost at least. And so this is exactly what I'm going to discuss today, is uh, to start with a lecture on trying to describe the interactions between two atoms. Okay, and that will be a complement to what uh, Eric has explained in his first lecture. So before I move on, do you have any questions so far already? It's meant to be an overview, right? And so once again, uh, no detailed questions, it's just to get the big picture. And I will dive more into the details now. No questions? I have the chat open, so you can also, if you want, uh, write directly in the chat. No questions? Don't seem to be any. OK. So this is the general outline of what I want to discuss. So essentially, today is going to be a handwritten uh, lecture uh, where we try to explain you what we mean by long range of that polar interactions between the atoms and the different regimes that they, that can exist. Tomorrow, I will dive more into the specific topics of uh, Rydberg atoms now by explaining you a bit of Rydbergology, how, what is a Rydberg atom, so kind of scaling law you can expect. I will describe how you prepare arrays of atoms uh, with arrays of tweezers, and I will describe uh, an important concept which is called Rydberg blockade and which is important to, uh, for applications to quantum information processing, which I will briefly flash 
tomorrow, actually, not giving too many details because that would be full lectures in their own. And the full um, description of a full description, some description of the many body physics using these Rydberg atoms, I will discuss in the third lecture uh, when I will uh, try to explain you how you can map that onto spin models and study transport properties, for example. Okay. Right, so let's start uh, by trying to understand uh, how atoms interact. So the goal of this lecture is to understand not the chemistry of the point. So the chemistry means when the atoms are very close to each other. What I want to understand is what happens when the atoms are reasonably far from each other, that I don't need to consider the binding of the atoms by a covalent uh, bound, for example, but what happens when they are, they are pretty far from each other. So you've already discussed that with uh, Eric before, the van der Waals type of interactions. And so in a sense, what I want to understand is this kind of spectrum. So this kind of spectrum is what is, uh, so that's something that has, was given to me by a theory a colleague in a nearby lab. So this is the spectrum, the energy spectrum of the rubidium molecule. It doesn't matter that it's rubidium, it can be, uh, any molecule, homonuclear homo molecule, essentially. But what you can see from here, well, you cannot really see, but I, I'm going to, to, to tell you, you have different scalings of the interaction strength as a function of distance. So first, this corresponds to the excitation of one electron uh, in the system. So you have something which is on the order of the EV time of energy scale. What you have here is a kind of a potential which to a growth, um, if you look from far, can look like the splitting of two energy levels. And then you've got in the ground state something which is reasonably flat. And if you zoom in, you will find that this has a scaling like C6 over R6, while this splitting would go like C3 over R4. So essentially, I would like to understand this structure, okay? Because there is a lot uh, contained in this. And the second thing that I would like uh, to understand, and is going to be much more quantitative, I want to understand the numbers. I want to understand the value of the C6 coefficients and, and know what they, 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 I mean, whether I can find with a very simple model, this exact value. And so what we're going to do today is to calculate the C6 coefficient of all this. And you will see that actually it's reasonably easy with a reasonably simple perturbation theory. So we want to understand quantitatively uh, this table. That's what we're going to do. Why do we want to do that? Well, we want to do that because understanding this long range interaction is key to calculate, for example, the scattering length, that is the governing properties of the Bose-Einstein condensate. And to a certain extent to uh, fermions as well, uh, when they interact in different spin states. So this is very important to understand the details of this C6 coefficient in order to be able to calculate the scattering length. Uh, which governs, once again, all the properties of quantum gases. And of course, for what interest is, uh, interests us in this lecture, we also want to do that in order to understand quantitatively the interactions between Rydberg atoms, which are the heart of uh, doing quantum simulation or quantum information processing using these atoms. Okay, no questions or questions? No questions? Okay, so uh, let's. Uh, sure. Um, you, you briefly mentioned that in the ground state, the coefficient is to C6 and an excited state is C3. Is there a kind yes. of threshold of, of how high you have to be in the excited state, or is it any excited okay. state? So that's an excellent question. Can you ask it to me in one hour from now if I have not uh, answered it? Because that's the goal uh, of the lecture to derive all this. Okay, so thanks for the question. It's a nice introduction for the next uh, part. There's also another Good. question I see, Antoine. Uh, yeah, could you clarify okay. what 5S, 5S means? Indeed, I can. Uh, once again, I'm going to say a bit more in, in uh, five minutes about that. But essentially, this is the usual spectroscopic notation that is used. So when you have 5S, you need to understand it. Like the principal quantum number of the atoms, n equal five, and S is the spectroscopic notation for the angular momentum, which is L equals zero. So when I say 5S, 5S, it means that I have prepared the first atom in the state N equal five, L equal zero, and the second atom in the state N equal five, L equal zero. Okay, that's atom A, atom B. Okay, it answers your question? 
Can I ask a question? Sure. So I guess back in Eric's lecture, he talked about how when S wave scattering dominates, then van der Waals interactions must apply. So in the, I guess, for these dipole dipole interactions for the one over R cubed, um, what kind of partial waves dominate there? Okay, so it will depend first uh, on the temperature of the atoms, what kind of partial wave contributes, but at low uh, collision, uh, it's a bit complicated because usually the C3 coefficient is not isotropic. So the first thing, contrarily to the C6 coefficient for most atoms, um, but still you can define a scattering length associated to that. Okay, so it's still possible to define S wave scattering on a C3 R, uh, over R3 potential. Uh, there are some mathematical problems when you calculate that about the divergence of the integral, but people have been able to calculate, for example, if you just take dipolar atoms or dipolar molecules, one over R3 with an inisotropic configuration, you can define an effective scattering length. Ana Maria, you want to add something about that? Yeah, well, L equal to one is an important contribution from dipole-dipole interactions too. Yeah. I mean, for many times we have identical fermions that can interact over with dipole-dipole interactions. So L equal to one is an important contribution from parts and wave, but you can have all of them in the in this. But, but in this sense, uh, if you have fermions, for example, all in the same spin state, you do not have any scattering for L equals zero. You need to go to higher partial wave anyway. I see. So. <clears throat> Thank so you. I don't know, maybe Eric is going to cover a bit that. I mean, I, I have to admit that myself, I'm going to ignore totally the spin uh, degrees of freedom in the in what I'm going to describe now. I mean, we can discuss that at the end of the lectures if you're interested or in, in the recap session later. Okay. Okay. There's <laughs> so, actually another, there's another quick question uh, in the chat. What's separating all the three? And, uh, I will answer to these questions uh, during the lecture, hopefully. So please uh, answer, ask the question again. Uh, yeah, for the moment, I'm just saying there are two types of interaction, one of our three, one of our two. And what we want to do now is to understand why there are those two kinds of interaction. But do they occur in different range of separation? Or you mean there's two different powers? Uh, like crossing over from one to the other, or do you mean there are two different situations? Well, actually, well, let's think. Mm -hmm. both things, you have a, cro a crossing from one over R6 to one over R cube, and sometimes the chemistry dominate between before you can reach the one over R cube, but I I, I'm going to discuss that. And, right. and the question of Jackson, I expect to see just two curves for 5S and 5P, what are the other curves? So, the other curves, I'm not going to discuss in detail because now comes the total mess. You need to, to have the spin of the atoms included, the hyperfine coupling, and this is the reason why you've got so many uh, curves because each of the atoms is not only described by principal quantum number and angular uh, momentum, but you also have the spin degrees of freedom, and then you've got the, the, uh, the nuclear degrees of freedom. And all this combines in each other to essentially give you these complicated uh, spaghettis. Uh, and that we're not going to describe because this is real uh, lectures on uh, you know, just calculating uh, uh, you know, a complicated energy spectrum. We'll just try to look at the coarse grain picture of this, but you will see that it's easy and it will be extremely fruitful for the Rydberg. The mess usually occurs when you need to include many internal states beyond the angular momentum and the principal quantum moment. Okay? Okay, so let's uh, try to start uh, and to discuss what we want to describe. So what we want to describe is the situation where we place two atoms, A and B, and they are separated by a distance R. Of course, an atom is a neutral thing, and so in principle, you should not have any interactions between them apart from gravity, which of course is totally negligible. So why is it that we do have an interactions? It exists because an atom is not a point-like particle. It exists because there is a tiny separation between the electrons and the nucleus. And because of this tiny separation, so I just represent that in the easiest way, saying that it's like an hydrogen atoms, oops. Essentially what you have is a dipole. Okay, so the region, the reason why neutral particles can interact is because they are not point-like. If they were point-like, no interactions. 
Okay, so they have no charge, so Q equals zero, of course, Q equals zero, but the fact that the plus and minus charge are slightly separated make them dipoles, and therefore they can interact, and you kind of know that this interaction is the square over R cube, which is what we're going to uh, discuss more into detail. So the first thing I want to remind you is what is a dipole, okay, and of course many of you know that in the context of, um, of uh, classical physics, but uh, let's see what is the quantum version of this. So what I'm going to take is, so I just take, once again, a charge ZQ surrounded by, so plus with minus charge, uh, minus uh, many electrons, minus Q, okay? And all these, you know, have like some kind of classical trajectories, if you wish, uh, minus Q. So this is an atom, okay? This atom, you've solved that in uh, AMO physics class, for the hydrogen atom. So essentially you've got an anionization threshold, a ground state, and you've got many bound states here. So what is that? It is the wave function characterized by principal quantum number for the electrons. So here I'm just writing that for one electron. Okay, so that's the wave function. It's called an orbital. It's the wave function of an electron around a nucleus. So you saw the Schrodinger equation with the, um, with, the, the, with the, the centrifugal barrier and all this. So you have the principal quantum number, you've got the orbital quantum number, and you've got the projection of the orbital quantum number onto a given axis, which is n. Of course, you've got other degrees of freedom, as we said, and you, you will have to include the spin. You will have to include the uh, spin of the nucleus, but we are not going to do that to understand the course picture. All right, so now uh, what I want to do is to define a dipole. So what is a dipole? Well, classically, you know what is a dipole. The dipole is the, is the, the object, which is the sum over one to Z, which is the number of electrons you get, of Q times Ri, the position of the ith electron, minus R, the position of the nucleus. So what is the geometry here? So you would have R, which is the position of the nucleus, and you have Ri, which is the position of the electron. And so therefore, what I call R minus Ri is this. Okay, so that's the distance between the nucleus and the electron. So that's plus Q plus minus. Okay, so now how do we make that? Uh, I mean, that's what you know from classical ENN. Eh? So if you have just one electron, essentially the dipole is just Q times the distance between the plus and minus charge. So now if you want to make it quantum, we use uh, the usual rule, which is we just put hats onto all the letters, the relevant letters. So essentially you move that into an operator. So now your operator is D hat. It's a vectorial operator. Okay, and so uh, the first thing we need to calculate if this is an operator is uh, the matrix element. Okay, so we're going to pick up a state N. So let me just, let me just uh, find matrix element of the D operator. So essentially I just consider first, what happens if my state is NLN, so defined by those three principal quantum number. So now my first question to you is, what is the matrix element of the dipole operator in a given state? So once again, in a sense, what I'm asking is, what is the permanent electric dipole moment of the atoms? So what is the, uh, the answer to that? You can write it in the chat or say it aloud. So once again, I repeat the question, what is the value of this, uh, this object? Zero, okay, I have lots of zeros and that's good because this is the right answer. It is zero. Why is it zero? It's zero because in an atom, fine, because of the properties of this, uh, this operator. So this operator essentially goes from minus D in a parity, a transformation. So essentially, if I want to calculate this in the form of an integral, what I will write is psi, psi NLM star QR psi NLM star D3R. So this is what I am. But in an atom, you know that 
a state has a given parity. It's either odd or even. So if I take L equal zero, it's going to be uh, even. If I take L equal one, it's going to be odd and vice versa. But still, there is always a parity. So now it means that the modulus square of San LM, which is what I have by merging this and this, gives me that, is always even, uh, always uh, we're even. So now if I integrate in a, uh, in a volume which is uh, symmetrical with respect to R, essentially, I integrate an even times an odd, and that has to give me zero. Okay, so that's the first thing is that an atom or any atomic structure in its ground state or in any given NLM state has no matrix element. It means it has no permanent uh, moment. Okay? That's, the first thing. So that's an atom I'm talking about. I'm not talking about molecule. I'm just talking about an atom. Okay, so essentially, if I want this structure to be non-zero, I need to consider N L M D N L plus or minus one M. And this can be non-zero. The role of M here, we're not going to argue, it's a bit of a detail, but so you need to have opposite parity for this to be non-zero. So that's the very first important thing to, to, to say. The dipole matrix element are, are only, the, the dipole operator, sorry, only has matrix elements that are non-zero for state of different parities. The parities separated by plus or minus one. Okay? You have to be a bit careful with this kind of argument. It's true for an atomic structure. It is usually not true for artificial atoms. And can you, can someone tell me, so for example, if I had taken a, a box, uh, so a quantum dot, this would probably not be true. Why wouldn't, uh, wouldn't it be true? So why would you have a permanent matrix, uh, matrix element? So actually, why would you have non-zero in case of um, a quantum dot? There is a very important property that I stated, broken SO3, if you wish. So essentially, it's, you, it, you only have zero if the parity is a good quantum number. So parity, yes, the fabrication breaks the parities. And exactly, so uh, Francisco has uh, given the answer. The parity, the, the fabrication breaks the parity. So the parity is not the proper quantum number. Okay, so in artificial atoms, you do not necessarily have H and L square that commutes. And therefore the priority is not a proper quantum number. And therefore you can construct structure with permanent dipole moment. But in any atoms, you have the parity because the Coulomb potential is essentially uh, invariant under the parity. And therefore the argument I've given you is true. Okay? Good, questions so far? No. All right, so now, of course, you can always ask, what is an average dipole? So what is an average dipole? Average dipole is if you have a state psi of t, which is not necessarily an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, I can always ask myself, what is the average value of the dipole? So let's do that in the simpler case. I'm going to consider a two-level atom. Two level atom, I'm going to decide there is a ground and excited state. Let's take some particular state of the hydrogen atom, the psi 1s one wave function of the hydrogen and the psi 2p of the hydrogen. So I'm using again the same spectroscopy notation, all right? So this corresponds to n equal one, this corresponds to l equal zero, p corresponds to l equal one. Okay, we're still using those notations uh, a century after they've been invented. They're not super clear, but okay, that's the tradition. And so now, what I'm going to say is that I'm going to call E, D, let's make it just a, a scalar, the, just assuming it has a given component, so the Z component, G, I'm going to call it D, E, G. So that's the matrix element, and that's fine. It's fine here, it's non-zero, because I've on purpose chosen two states with opposite parity. So the thing just has a, a meaning, okay? And so now I'm going to create a superposition psi of t, which is alpha ground plus beta 
e to the minus omega zero t when it evolves as a function of time e. So alpha and beta are just real number in such a way that the state is normalized. And so now that I have that, I can, of course, as an aside, once again, huh? E dE is G dG is zero. But here, that's not what I'm considering. I'm considering a superposition state. So now if I can calculate the average dipole, which is the quantity, which is here, this average dipole, if you do the full calculation, it's not very difficult, but essentially what you find is this. Cosine omega t. All right, so what you have, you've created a superposition. The superposition has an energy difference corresponding to a transition at omega zero. And this superposition will look like an oscillating dipole. Okay, that's clear for everyone, this? So let's try to illustrate that, actually. So I take the hydrogen atom. So essentially what I place here are wave functions. So this is the wave function 1s of a 1d, if you wish, uh, hydrogen atom. So this is e to the minus r divided by the Bohr radius. This is the psi 2p, which essentially is e to the minus r over a naught times r. Okay, it looks like that as a function of r. And we're going to create the superposition, which is essentially the superposition of psi 1s plus psi 2p, e to the minus omega naught t. Okay, that will be my wave function, psi of r as a function of t. Okay, and so now I'm going to ask myself, what is the density of electrons? So I'm going to ask myself, psi r of t modulus square, what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to psi 1s square plus psi 2s square, uh, psi 2p square, sorry, plus two, let's make the wave function real, psi 1s psi 2p cosine omega naught t. Okay, and so let me plot this as a function of time. This is, uh, oops, sorry, it's supposed to be a movie that oscillates. So essentially what you, uh, when you add those number at t equals zero, the thing is going to loop slightly down like this, sorry, because of the minus and slightly asymmetrical, okay? This is at t equals zero. I just add the superposition of this guy plus this guy. But of course, now the relative phase of those two are going to vary. So essentially what you will see is your total electronic density will not be centered at zero. Right? So the electronic density here, what if you calculate psi, which is this quantity, psi square, represented at t equals zero, you see that you have a bit more electronic density on the right side than you have on the left side. What is the meaning of that? It means that in average, your electron is not on the nucleus, but it's slightly away from the nucleus. The center of mass of this energy, this density distribution is here instead of being right at r equals zero. This is clear or not, this thing? So in principle, I have a small animation which doesn't seem to work. Let me just try again, it doesn't seem to work. Where you would see this as a function of time would get distorted. So you do have the picture by superimposing those two wave functions that are eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, but with a relative weight, you form something which is an object, the density of electrons, which oscillates from up to down, and therefore it acts exactly as a dipole. So this is what is a dipole quantum mechanically, an average dipole. So by superimposing, superimposing two states of different parties, you can create it on oscillating dipole. But of course, when I say that, I need to maintain the superposition because if I have an, an oscillating dipole D of T oscillating at a frequency omega naught, it radiates. And because it radiates, you will lose energy. And so that allows me to bring you uh, to a second important formula that I will use, which is that if I calculate the average dipole built as a superposition of, of uh, E and G, I will have something that oscillates as a function of time, but which is damped, okay? The damping you can calculate from classical ENM, and I'm not going to redo the calculation. It can also be calculated by the Fermi golden rule, looking at what is the spontaneous emission of these states? How does it decay to the ground state? The formula is the following one, and that's a very important formula we're going to use many times. It's 
omega naught cube over C3 times three pi epsilon naught one over H bar. Okay, so essentially what I'm saying, you've got an oscillating dipole. These dipoles radiate. What is the decay rate? So which is to say the rate of loss of energy or the damping of the dipole as a function of time it is given by this quantity. So it rings a bell in most heads, this uh, formula, this is the, the derivation. I mean, you derive it in a quantum optics class usually. Uh, it's the Fermi golden rule to calculate the decay rate of a two level atom. But you can also completely recover it through classical EMM. Questions? No question. So let, let's put number on this thing. Let's consider first that the transition, the two level I'm considering are separated by a transition in the microwave regime. So if I am in the microwave regime, essentially the transition, uh, so sorry, uh, the, the, the frequency is around a gigahertz. So this is what omega zero is, a few gigahertz. And the gamma essentially for all these transition, gamma goes to, uh, to zero, sorry, essentially because omega naught goes down. It's not the only reason, but that's one of the, the reasons. So essentially you can think of it as a static dipole. Therefore, you can have many oscillations within omega naught. Okay, so you have many of these oscillations. So it's not at all the way represented it. So you would have many oscillations before the thing dams out. Let's take an optical transition. G and E, the wavelength associated to that is in a micrometer region, or the frequency, if you wish, is around omega naught, is something around 400 terahertz. Same thing. So the Q factor of the oscillator, if you wish, the Q, which is the omega naught of a gamma, gamma is typically on the order of 10 megahertz for many atoms, while here, this is typically 4 10 to the 12 hertz. So you see that the Q factor of this oscillator is typically 10 to the six. So it's a huge, very highly resonant oscillator, okay? And again, it's associated to the oscillation of the dipole when you create a superposition. Okay, questions so far? No? All right, so. Let me uh, move to the dipolar interactions between two atoms. So now we're going to take two of these atoms. Okay. These atoms will, uh, so one will be the reference in space, if you wish. The other one will be separated by a distance r. This one, just to make it simple, we can write the full formula, but I'm not going to do it. We're just going to assume that atom A has an electron, which I will call uh, electron one and atom B as another electron. So those are two hydrogen atoms, if you wish, which I will call 2E, and you've got here R. So we'll call it R1A, we'll call it R2B. And then of course, you've got the possibility that the first electron is attracted by the second nucleus and the second electron is attracted by the first nucleus. And the other thing that you can also add are the two electrons that actually repel each other. So now, if we write the full Hamiltonian of this thing, and what I'm going to write is exact, it's P1 square over 2M minus E square over R1A, that corresponds to the traction of the first electron by the first atom. Same thing with the second electron, P2 square over 2M minus E square over R2A, 2B, sorry. But I have other terms. I have the possibility that the nucleus repel each other. So now I have something which is E square over R, the distance between the two nucleus, but the two electrons can also repel each other. So we will have an E square over R12. And I can also have what I say, which is electron one is attracted by atom B. So minus E square over R1P minus E square over R2. Two a, okay, and this is the part that I'm really interested in. So this part is the thing that leads to the dipole, dipole interactions. 
So I'm not going to do the calculation because it's a pretty lengthy Taylor expansion, which is a bit painful, but essentially what you should remember is that if I take, for example, any of these quantity here, you can write it R plus some kind of rho, if you wish. The rho can be either, so for example, if I just, this distance here is actually R plus R to B. And so you do the Taylor expansion of the thing, and so what you will have as a result is one over r, one minus r dot r over two r square, minus r square over r square, what I call r is it's small rho, I'm sorry, plus three half of rho dot r over r square square. Okay, and there are of course other terms behind. So now, I have an approximation, which is if the size of the atom, let's say typically it's on the order of A0, is much less than the interparticle distance, I can perform my Taylor expansion. Oops. And what I have when I perform the Taylor expansion is the following thing. So once again, there are a few calculations, a bit tedious, you can find them in many ENM books, but essentially what you have is H, of interaction, so only this part here, which I can write. Uh, so first I should remind you one notation, sorry about that. What I call E square is the charge of the electron divided by four pi epsilon naught, and that's the tradition of this. So what you have at the end is something which looks like Q square of a four pi, four pi epsilon naught, R1 dot R2 minus three R1 dot u r2 dot u over r cube where u is the unit vector between r and the total r okay and so essentially now you have the dipolar hamiltonian if you just remind that remember that this dipole is q dot r so q one two one two then you've got the dipolar Hamiltonian, which in its full glory writes d1 dot d2 minus 3 d1 u d2 u over r cube for pi epsilon. Okay, so once again, I'm pretty sure that most of you have seen that, but you see that it derives from just looking at the simplest uh, atomic structure. Okay, so now. What about the quantum aspect of this? Well, quantum aspect, always the same thing. We just put hats on what's need to be hatted. So essentially the operators. So this is an operator which acts in the Hilbert space of the two atoms. So essentially now the Hilbert space that describes that is the tensor product of the Hilbert space of the first atom times the Hilbert space of the second atom. So any state that I need to consider in order to apply this object is going to be a uh, state of the form N L N1 L1 N1 plus, uh, sorry, tensor N2 L2 M2. Okay, so it has to act on two wave functions associated each to one atom. Okay, so questions? No? I have a quick question. Sure. Is there a way to physically understand the difference between these two terms in the dipole Hamiltonian, or are they always kind of lumped together as one thing? Uh, say that again. Can you repeat the question? There's two terms in that dipole interaction. Uh, yes. Is, is there any meaningful way to separate them as two physical effects? Well, you could uh, by having a tensorial part and a, and a scalar part, but it's not too meaningful for what I want to do. I mean, some people do that usually uh, when you study molecular physics, but I don't need to do that here. Uh, it, it answered your question or I'm just uh, drawing the fish as we say. I think it's good enough for now. Okay. <laughs> okay. And so now I, what we're doing, if, yes. Could I just clarify on the previous slide? Sure. This expansion that you were doing for the one over R plus rho, that's mm -hmm. for R12. Uh, oh. This is for any, uh, so for example, what I have here, uh, let's consider R12. So R12 is indeed R minus R1 
plus R2. Right. So your rho here would be this quantity. If I just take R1B, let me get it right, this would be R plus, um, plus what actually? Yo, sorry, oh, let's, yes, oh, uh, plus uh, R, uh, this is this minus this, so minus R1A. R1A, okay, I see. Yeah. So indeed here, no, okay, you're completely right. I should have been a bit less sloppy. Let me re re plot here the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe, no, I don't know if it helped, but these two terms is what they give you the one minus three cos squared theta, that is the typical dipole dipole. So, so that you need the two terms to get the anisotropicity. The cos so this is what gives you the anisotropy, huh? uh, the, this kind of uh, you know, pattern that you see, and we'll come back to that tomorrow. Uh, this is what you have here. Okay. Okay, so now let me go for a small toy model, uh, which uh, is actually very. Uh, Enlightening, I find. Oops. Okay, so let me consider now two atoms, one in the ground state, the other one in the excited state. Okay, separated by R. So essentially, the toy model consists of considering each of the atoms as a two level system. So now I will call DEG, as we've already done, the matrix element connecting the dipole, which I will assume is along one given axis. It's not too important for the moment, but it will simplify the thing. I will assume the following configuration, so as I don't have to worry about this extra term, 3 D1 minus uh, D1 dot U and so on. So this is D1 would be considered as a linear dipole, D2 as a linear dipole, and R is actually orthogonal, okay? So essentially now with this, the Hamiltonian is D1, D2, there is no, it becomes scalar if you wish, over R cube. And what I will do as well to simplify the notation, I will drop the four pi epsilon node because it's a pain in the butt to carry. But of course, it should always be remembered that they should be around when you want to do numerics. Okay, so now let me uh, try to plot what is the full spectrum for the two atoms. So essentially, I write the atom, the, the energy of two atoms. I mean, it's reasonably easy to do. I have the energy which is zero when the two atoms are in the ground state. Now, calling omega naught the distance between E and G, I can have either the first or the second atom in the excited state. So now I have two degenerate states, G and E, and E and G. Okay? Or I can have the two atoms in the ground state. In the, sorry, in the excited state. So this is the EE state. All right? And the energy here is two times natural omega. Let's write the matrix Hamiltonian, the, the matrix of the Hamiltonian. So what do we have? I mean, we have on, so I will use the basis, which is GGEE, -E, EG, GE. -E. Okay, so of course on the diagonal, I have the, uh, the full Hamiltonian, I have the energy, so I will have zero, two H bar omega naught, I will have H bar omega naught, H bar omega naught. Is this? <coughs> And now let's ask ourselves what are the states that are coupled to each other by the dipolar Hamiltonian here? Well, I mean, I have all the states like this one is coupled to ground ground, EG is coupled to uh, ground ground, GE with ground ground, this one as well, and those two as well. And that's it. What do you, uh, why am I saying that? Just let's take an example. I just take GG. D1, D1, GE. Uh, I'm sorry, I lied to you. I completely lied to you. Just made a mistake. It's totally wrong. Sorry about that. Let me just recap. So you erase the, and you do not broadcast what I've just said over the last uh, five minutes. That was all wrong. Okay. So now uh, comes the thing. EG and GE are coupled with each other because you have this, 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 this. So that will give me DEG square over RQ. Okay. And then you have EG and GE, which are also coupled to each other. Same thing, EG, E, G. So now what I have, which are coupled, are 
those two states and EE and GG. So now if I, I write what are the matrix elements, I have DEG cube, DEG over R cube, zero, zero, which was exactly the mistake I was uh, doing a minute ago. And now I have DEG over R cube, DEG over R cube. So the thing which is interesting with this toy model is that it will give me both the resonant dipole interaction, the one over R cube, and the van der Waals interaction. I have everything built in this matrix. Because this matrix is block diagonal, as you can see. So I just need to care about each block in a separated way. OK? So if I move to uh, the first block, so the first block, I repeat, H1 is 0 to H bar naught, DEG square over R cube, DEG square over R cube. OK? So now, let me use perturbation theory. And that's something that maybe uh, is very useful, especially, I mean, the theories usually they know that, but the exponential is not necessarily, is to very rapidly give the eigenvalues and the eigenstate of this kind of matrix when delta is much larger than V. So what are the solutions for this? I mean, you can do the calculation. I'll just give you the result. Essentially, you would have 0 minus V square of a delta. And the other one, which has would have delta, would be shifted by an amount, which is V square of a delta. So that's the result of perturbation theory or a Taylor expansion of the exact eigen energies. And the state associated to that, if we have ground excited, would be ground is a new ground, if you wish, is ground plus V of a delta E. And the new excited is the excited minus V of a delta G. So honestly, having this in mind, uh, helps you, I mean, I'm talking to the experimentalists, understand 90% uh, of what the theories do. Am I uh, <laughs> kidding, uh, Anna? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. OK, so it's a kind of important. You can re-diagonize that for you, but I'm going to do it here. Now <coughs> apply to this, what do you have? You've got two energies, 0, 2 h bar omega, uh, omega 0. The first one is going to be shifted when I turn on the interaction term by an amount which is DEG square over R cube square divided by two H bar omega naught. The upper state is going to be shifted up by an amount which is the same with just a plus sign. So this is wonderful. What do we have? We have an interaction, which is C6 over R6. Second order perturbation theory. The dipole-dipole interaction, although it's a one over R cube interaction, it gives you to second order perturbation theory, the one over R6. And the thing which is important is that, of course, you do not have zero order or first order. The D1, D2, of uh, R cube G, G, which would be, if you wish, the energy shift at first order perturbation theory is zero because you do not have any dipole in a given uh, state. While here, what we are calculating is the second order perturbation theory, which gives you the C6 over R6. OK, so this is what is called the van der Waals into oops, yeah. No, no, no. So it comes from free. Enfin, from free, you have to work a bit better. Okay, so that's the first thing. Any questions so far? So this is uh, the first important result. I just want to clarify that uh, when you write a Hamiltonian, you yes. have a uh, you just have the first scalar term, so there's no tensor part of the uh, of the dipole dipole interaction. Is it... uh, sorry, yeah. I'm not sure I understood the question. Oh, so, or uh, I think it's like the be like the two slides before. So basically, the Hamiltonian you have d one d two divided by a cube, 
But yes. like, but uh, how about these tensor part where you have d one, uh, dot u and uh, d two dot u that okay. tensor. Okay, good question. So this part I set it to zero because I'm assuming that the dipoles are perpendicular to R. So the D1 oh, okay. with this particular the geometry, this gives me zero. It, once again, it's just, you can keep it of course, but it's just to simplify the notations and give you like uh, the idea of what's going on, okay? So, but like uh, in reality, is this true? I mean like- Sorry? In, in, uh, in experiment, is this well, part- I'll come back to the experiment in a minute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Wait, can I just ask uh, to clarify? Sure. One, uh, when you showed the two body curves, you had both one of our cubed and one of our six. So yeah. now you've derived one of our six for intervals. Yes. What, what about one of our cubed? So now, so let me derive the one of our cube. We're going to take the second block. Second oh. block was h bar omega naught, h bar omega naught, DEG over R cube, DEG over R cube. Oh, that's degenerate perturbation. And this thing is degenerate. Therefore, the eigenstates now, I can diagonalize exactly, are just DEG square over R cube. Beautiful. Okay. So the second block is not treated the same way as the first block because the two states are now degenerate. So I do not need to resort to perturbation theory for this one. This is an exact diagonalization of this part of the matrix. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. Okay. And what are the eigenstates? So essentially what I have now are around the energy h bar omega naught, as a function of R, I have the plus DEG over R cube, the minus DEG square over R cube, and the states are the symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations. So I will have something which is one over root EG minus GE, which now are the new eigenstate, and EG, and actually if I do it right, there is a plus here, EG plus minus, sorry, GE, one over R2. And those have names actually, oops. This is called a subradiant state. And I'm just throwing you the names at you. Uh, just not, uh, I will not uh, explain in a detail why. Uh, we can discuss that later in a chat or if you wish. The first one is called uh, the lowest one, the superradiant state. And the upper one is called the subradiant state. It's the, if you wish, is the minus superposition and the plus superposition. But so now what have we seen and what have we learned with this story model? We've learned something which at the end is not uh, this kind of, ah, so I cannot change the color of my pencil any longer. Okay, I still need to, allez. Bon. Okay, what have we learned? We've learned. that h bar omega, sorry, the ground state and the two h bar omega naught, essentially you would have the h bar omega naught. What you have as a function of r in the ground state is something which behave as like c6 over r6. In the upper state, it behave as like c6 over r6, but with just the opposite sign. And in between, it behaves like c3 over r3 with a plus and with a minus. Okay, so with this very simple model, you've got essentially the lower state of a real molecule. Okay? Is that clear that? So in chemistry, people have names for that. Huh? Uh, you, you remember maybe from your chemistry class, if I just uh, look at, not at short at a large distance, but shorter range, you've got what is called the binding and anti-binding orbitals. They all show up here. The anti-symmetric combination is called the anti-binding orbital and the, uh, the positive uh, superposition is called the binding orbital. Okay, and you recover that from this model. Uh, of course, what we've calculated is the long range aspect of this. Huh? 
But if you go shorter, you will find this. And at the end of the day, this actually works not so badly. What we have found is essentially this part here. That's the C6 over R6. Now, if you look at coarse grain, what happens here, you do have the energy splitting of those two things, one over R3. And actually, if you look, and it's much harder to see in the higher state for a real molecule, but essentially this here, coarse grain would be the opposite of this one. So you would have the plus C6 over R6. What does it correspond to? It corresponds to two rubidium atoms. The first one in, the, in the, its ground state 5s, first excited state is 5p, second for the other one. So it's instead what you do, you replace the notations that was my ground excited, ground excited now by real orbitals. So this very simple model allow you to understand already the uh, spectrum, uh, coarse grain, I agree with you, of real molecules. Now, the next thing I want to do is to calculate the ground state of a real atom and show you that with our simple model, we have a very good numerical agreement uh, with, the, the, with what people measure. So let me now go back to the ground state of a real atom. Let me take now, so a real atom and look at the ground state. So I'm going to consider the following uh, notation. So X, Y, Z, got atom here, an atom here, atom A, atom B. So now I will keep all the terms in my dipole-dipole interaction. So essentially, if I keep all the terms, you will have something which is one over four pi epsilon naught, R cube, and you will have a D1X, or DAX if you wish, DBX, plus dy, day, dby. And if you do the thing with the particular geometry that I put here, you will have a minus two daz, dbz. Okay, so now I've kept all the terms in order to get that. Okay, so now let me just consider hydrogen atom or let's say any atom which in its ground state can be described uh, in a state NS, so the two state system is NS, and I need to consider the excited state. So each atom will have orbitals, let's say NPX, NPY, NPZ. What is P? P corresponds to L equals zero, and roughly speaking, X can be considered as M equal plus one. I mean, the theory should scream at this level, but it's not too important for what I'm going to discuss. Is X, Y, and Z is plus zero minus one. So what I'm looking at now is the very same toy model, if you wish, of a state NS and a state NPX, NPY, NPZ, coupling to another one of the same structure. But now let me apply perturbation theory to the second order as we've learned. So this is my H bar omega naught. Then I will have the energy shift of the state NS, NS to second order perturbation theory, which is one over four pi epsilon naught R cube, square, is the square of the matrix element. There is a minus sign. I have the one over H bar omega naught with a factor two. That's the formula. And then I have the dipole matrix element. So I will have a DPX S matrix element square. That's essentially the one, if you wish, oops, connecting this and this. So it's as if I had three two level system in one atom, if you wish. Then I will have the same with this guy and the same with this guy. But it's just that for the MPZ, there is a factor two in the Hamiltonian. So and once again, I'm not doing anything. I remind you the result that we've derived before. This is shifted by minus DEG square over R cube square divided by the difference in energy to H bar omega naught. I'm just applying this very same formula for this more complicated atomic structure. Plus DPYS modulo square plus four, which is the square of two, DPZ S square. Once again, and to understand this notation, it means Px, D, 
Donc, c'est ma plus élément de S de W square. OK, so that's what we have as a shift. But we also have another formula. We know that when we have a two-level system, the decay rate, which is the quantity I can easily measure, is h bar gamma is dg square k cube of a three pi epsilon naught, and that's it, where k is omega naught over c. So I can eliminate all my matrix elements here and write instead gamma, which is a measurable quantity. And if you do all this, what you find is that this DNS NS has a very simple expression, which is minus, so there is a, a B coefficient, and in 27, 16, so it's not too important. You will have an H bar gamma of a KR to the power six, and you get a gamma over omega naught. The omega naught is this one. This, uh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake here. It needs to be understood at the fourth power huh? in perturbation theory. So is that clear how I derive that? Essentially, in the matrix element, which are here, I just replaced by gamma square. And that's the reason why I've got gamma, gamma. But I write it in a slightly different way, h bar gamma over kr r6, because then you see the, item, the dimension of the quantity, gamma over omega naught. OK? Antoine, one very small question. Uh, sure. So presumably, there are really small contributions from other principal quantum numbers or stuff. This is just totally negligible, is that? Let me move to the next slide. So we compare the formula we have, which gives you the C6 coefficient with the real life. What we've just calculated, so the numerical value that you find here are the one I've calculated directly from this formula. This is what you obtain for lithium with lithium, potassium, potassium, uh, sodium, sodium, and so on. And you compare to the measured value in atomic unit. And you see that amazingly enough, the only knowledge of the decay rate of the low-lying transition is enough to know within a few percent the C6 coefficient, at least for the alkali. So you see the model is reasonably simple. This is really a toy model, and it gives you an excellent agreement. I mean, it depends what you call excellent, but actually something which is already very close to the measured value. It works also for more complicated atoms. As you can see, it's less good. We do agree with that. Actually, the larger the atoms, which are the more polarizable the atoms, and that comes to your question, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the worse it is. I mean, apart from the alkali, which essentially look like hydrogen atoms. And then it doesn't work so well if you look at lanthanide, for example, which is to be expected because the ground state is much more complicated than just an NSNS state. But you see that this simple toy model allows you to understand the C6 coefficient of essentially all of the species that have been both condensed. Do we not so bad? Okay. And and is it a simple explanation for like the erbium and dysprosium ateribium? Is the discrepancy? Uh, is that there no, are closer I haven't. Levels? Or uh, just sorry, uh, repeat the what you said. Is the, the discrepancy bigger just because the other levels you're not accounting for are closer? Yes, exactly. Yeah, they are there, exactly. Yes, because there are many other levels, and so you need to include many transitions. Okay. So. In the last, uh, and so I'm almost done, so that's fine. What I want to discuss now is uh, just excited states, because of course the title of my lectures was Riedberg atom. So far you've seen no Riedberg, you've just seen interaction, but just to see, to show you that it falls into the same category of the thing. So now, essentially, we're going to look at the case of Riedberg atoms. So let me plot the spectrum of two Rydberg atoms. I haven't said what is a Rydberg atom, so from what I'm going to discuss uh, today, it doesn't matter. Essentially, those are high excited state, highly excited state, but I need to consider the two atoms energy in the very same way I've done it. So essentially now I have a first Rydberg atoms, let's say in a state N state, NS, sorry, the other one in a state NS. And these states, these pair states corresponding to one atom in NS, the other one in NS are going to be coupled to many other pair states where you've got N1 
uh, L1, N2, L2. Of course, with the L1 here, let's call, uh, which are different from, okay. so, uh, which have to be, oops, L1 minus uh, has to be plus or minus one here if I uh, want to be uh, able to connect to this state. Okay, and you've got plenty of these states. And they're all connected by a matrix element, which is going to be N1, L1, uh, N2, L2, H dipole dipole, N, L, N, L, if I started from N, L, for example. Okay, so we have many of these matrix elements that I need to calculate. So it's a gigantic mess. And so at the end of the day, if I want to calculate the shift in energy of NS, NS in second order perturbation theory, I just apply what I've done before, which is I will sum over all the excited states. So I will stay uh, the other state, N1, L1, N2, L2, of the square of the matrix element, N1, L1, N2, L2, HDD, NL, NL, modulus square, over the energy difference, NL times two minus NL, one and one minus N2, L2. Knowing that this one has an energy two ENL, and this one has an energy EN1, L1, N2, L2, for example. Okay, so this is just a generalization of before, but now the, there's a big difference, which is your state NL is not necessarily the lowest one. It can be in between many other states. And the consequence is that HDD, of course, is still my one over R3. I need to cube it, to square it, sorry, so it gives me my one over R6. But the C6 coefficient that I have now is not necessarily always negative. So C6 can be positive or negative, depending on where, what is the relative sign of these various uh, detunings. So you see, for, for Rydberg states, now the situation is a bit more complicated. You need to add many states, uh, and many actually usually contribute if you want to have a given uh, C6, okay? Another thing which I can, of course, look at, and then it becomes much cleaner to the toy model, much closer to the toy model, is what happens if I have two atoms, one in S, the other one in a P state. It's degenerate with the N prime P and S state, and therefore, you have exactly oops, the same thing as before, which is the energy spacing with C3 over R3. This is called a resonant dipole dipole interaction. Antoine? Can I ask yeah. another quick question? Um, sure. So you'd mentioned these uh, different principal quantum numbers uh, contribute in the sum. Do you also have to include the uh, continuum states? Do they make an important contribution? No, I mean, for the interaction, it's really negligible. I mean, at the level that we're doing that. Uh, so indeed, the one above the continuum, they do not contribute to calculate the C6. I mean, uh, of course, it's all a matter of precision in the thing, but for the, the precision that we use, and actually, as we will see tomorrow, for real atoms anyway, uh, the, even this, the exact energy levels are not so well known. We have a quantity is called a quantum defect, which we need to measure. Uh, I mean, it's measured with a pretty good accuracy, but I mean, it's a finite accuracy. All right. I want to make sure we have some time for questions and discussion. Yeah. So actually, uh, I'm done essentially. So the, the only thing I wanted to say, uh, but the tablet is broken, so that's fine. It's perfect to stop here uh, for this. Okay. Oops. The the last thing I wanted to say that of course those days when you want to calculate the interactions between two Rydberg atoms, you certainly don't do perturbation theory and add yourself your things. You go online and they have very good uh, calculators. It's not so old and this kind of thing uh, is from like three, four, five years ago. And people have uh, created codes that calculated all that. And so you can, for example, that's an example of two Rydberg atoms uh, that uh, interact 
And essentially, I've calculated for two rubidium atoms, 61D3F, the potential curve as a function of distance. And you see there are many. So they all features the gross uh, behavior that we've described today. Uh, but of course, the details are uh, uh, I mean, have to be calculated numerically for Hindberg atoms. All right, so I'm done with what I wanted to uh, tell you today. So essentially, Tomorrow, we'll do arrays of atoms and uh, basics of Rydberg physics. So now, questions. Okay, wonderful. So now we're open for questions. Uh, uh, so I encourage all the students to. Uh, I had a question. Sure. Uh, is there a good classical argument for the one over R6 and one over R cube in this setting without using this? Perturbation so is there a good classical argument for sorry the for the one over r6 interaction and ah. also the one <laughs> over r3 uh, yes there is a good argument um which was something if i had a bit of time to do it um i mean that, that would honestly i would have been uh, in boulder and would all have been together that's excellent for a small problem session and a discussion but yes you can uh, you just assume the following thing once again, you just take two classical atoms, okay? And you just assume that the dipole is of each atom is a random variable that can take any direction, because of course, at a given time, an electron in an atom can be at a given position. Let's assume the electron is here. The electron is here, is going to create an electric field here at the position of the second atom. So you're going to induce a dipole. This dipole is going to be correlated with the first one. So the field that you produce, the second dipole, is essentially proportional to the electric field created by the first atom and the second one, which is one over R cube. Okay? And so now the thing feeds back on this one. So the interaction energy essentially is D2 times the electric field it interacts with, which is the field it has created, which is minus alpha, well, there's a minus sign here, times E12 square. And you see the one over R6 that comes in uh, in a purely classical argument. But what matters here now, and that's the very essential argument, which is the reason why people uh, tell you that uh, okay. the average dipole of each atom is zero because at any given time, you can have the orientation of the electron anywhere. But the thing which is non zero is the variance of the dipole. And that's this variance, which actually comes up here, because you can rewrite this as the variance of D2 square, if you wish, or D1 square, it's equivalent. Or another way to say it is the variance of D1 dot D2, but when the two things are not independent because they are correlated with this picture, the first one induces the dipole and therefore the two of them are correlated. So sorry, it's an answer which is a bit longer than what you, <laughs> but. Right, and the one over R cubed, I guess, for that, because- no, But the one over R cubed is simply two rigid dipoles or two oscillating dipoles. You just take two dipoles that oscillate between S and P exactly the way I've done it initially. S and P, S and P, you create any superposition. You have a dipole oscillating at E to the minus omega naught T. It's a rigid dipole if you want now, the two oscillates and therefore it's direct dipole-dipole uh, um, interaction. Because the average dipole is not zero, because you've created the superposition. Thank you. Well, how did the superposition get created? Uh, you mean in the, uh, you need to create it to start with. You're driving it or? Sorry? Are you driving the system or how? Well, I will show you tomorrow. What you can do is to create an imbalanced superposition. You can take two atoms, place one here and the other one here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But now, in a real molecule, when you are here, it's really because each state is in itself a superposition of EG and G. So you do have the dipoles mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. first order. It's an entangled state, but it doesn't matter. It means that uh, each atom is in a superposition of being up and being down. But experimentally, with a laser beam, you can create, uh, I will show that to you tomorrow. I mean, you can create the first Rydberg atoms in state P, the other one in state S. And therefore, you the dipole starts from there. Mm -hmm. I see. So yeah. So it's not a pure uh, parity state. It's not a pure. Sorry. Parity doesn't have a. Yes, it's a mixture of. Uh... Yes, it's exactly yes. 
Yeah, it cannot be a pure state either D, G uh, or E, because P or S, because otherwise you have no dipoles, but you have right. a coupling between the two. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, so in your talk, you focused on the radial dependence of the energy. I'm wondering whether you comment on the uh, angular dependence as well, whether Okay, I, I will ask uh, to I will have to ask you to repeat the question because I have not understood. Sorry, the, the sound became very bad. So, oh, sorry. Um, so in your talk, you focus on the radial dependence of the energy. I'm wondering whether there would be any angular dependence as well. No, there is. Uh, so for the van der Waals interaction, if you are in the S state, there is none. In an S state, essentially, the C six okay. is isotropic. To a certain extent, if you don't apply an electric field, uh, magnetic field, or whatever, but if it's in free space, for most atoms, it will be isotropic. Now, if you are in the uh, NP uh, and PS thing, if you calculate everything, what you will find uh, is that this. So now, keeping, uh, for example, keeping the uh, d1, d2, and the other term you will find that the C3 is one minus three cosine square theta with the angle theta, which is this one, the internuclear axis AB with respect to the quantization axis. So indeed, uh, it, it has an angular part, which is the thing that in the toy model I've neglected just to make the equation simple, but you can do exactly the same calculation Calculating the matrix element for something keeping the D1 minus D2, so uh, on any polarization of the dipoles, and you will find that popping up. It answers your question, so? Yes, 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 thank you. I mean, that's the point with that when you lecture uh, by writing the equation, you want to carry as little uh, symbols as possible. So I simplify the toy model a bit, maybe. Yeah. Other questions? Coming back to the formula for C6, I know this uh, interesting dependence on gamma squared. Yeah. There's some kind of intuitive, like this kind of looks like two spontaneous emissions. Is there something, uh, some well, I mean, argument or is this just kind of a, I don't know, coincidence? Well, in uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't know. The, the, the way it's coming from is the D4. Okay, the D4 gives you the gamma square. And this kind of classical picture, sorry, uh, in this kind of classical picture that I've given you of the correlation between the dipoles, you can maybe see it as kind of, you know, one gamma for the first, uh, this one establishing a correlation with the first one and vice versa, you've got another gamma here, which comes once again from the D2E12 e and this one being proportional to E12. But honestly, so I'm not sure what I'm saying is particularly convincing. So in a nutshell, I don't know, okay? Uh, it comes from the D4, the D4 comes from the correlations between the two dipoles. Uh, and as a D is proportional to uh, square root of gamma or D square is proportional to gamma, it gives you the gamma square. Um, I would be a bit cautious with saying that there is spontaneous emission or anything like that. And all these are virtual process of the exchange of photons. Now you never populate the excited set. I remember the C6 coefficient, it comes from the GG, uh, sorry, the EE being coupled to the D GG. And you never populate this guy. The atoms are always in their ground state. So it's only through perturbation theory that you virtually populate them, if you wish. And that's the d square over r cube, square over the energy difference. So I'm not sure I've answered your question. But so essentially, uh, I don't have a super good argument and a super good intuition in terms of uh, two spontaneous correlated spontaneous emission to explain that. Okay, yeah, it seems to be more like a um, neat coincidence, right? There's no. Okay, I, I guess I see. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, this gamma, you always have to be, be a bit careful because the gamma, it's all, I mean, most of us, we learn it in two different uh, instant uh, occasions. The first one is. Uh, Fermi golden rule to calculate the decay rate of a two level atoms. 
but that's usually uh, in the context of spontaneous emission. But you can always remember the gamma as the rate of emission of energy of a classically radiating dipole. Uh, and that's where you learn it first. Usually it's in a classical ENM. Uh, so you have to be a bit careful in, in saying that because I have gamma, it means I have spontaneous emission. It rather means I have dipoles radiating energy. So we're running a little bit behind. Uh, so, uh, and I know it's a little bit heavy. So uh, today's schedule is a little bit heavy just by virtue of being the first uh, day. Um, so maybe we'll we'll stop the discussion here. Uh, although I really, you know, hate to do this uh, uh, because there's one item on the uh, next item on our agenda is to do introductions uh, and have lunch over those introductions, join us introductions. So maybe we, uh, let's thank Antoine for a wonderful uh, first lecture. And then uh, we will, yeah. Thank you, Antoine. So and then more. I really want to, maybe we'll take uh, a five minute break, uh, just, uh, and then we'll reconvene in five minutes just to, quickly go through and kind of introduce each other. We'll go around the room, so to speak, and uh, say a few words. And I, I sent you an email about this. Uh, yeah. So let's take a little break. Uh, and then I won't even shut off Zoom. We'll be, I'll, I'll shut off the recording, but uh, we'll, we'll keep rolling. So hopefully most of you won't leave and just maybe take a bathroom break or uh, this should go pretty quickly. My guess is per person, we'll have under a minute uh, uh, for these introductions, maybe even less. So thank you again. And uh... Thanks, guys. Thanks, Antoine. Great talk. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going for dinner. Or am I supposed yes, to Yes, thank you. See you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you.